we're very happy to have him here today, so please give a huge round of applause for Professor Andreas Scheicher. Thank you very much. And uh, I actually want to start by saying how much a fan I am of the Haus der Kleinforscher. You know, there are lots of initiatives to sort of push science curricula into kindergarten and early early. That's not the secret. But I think what they are doing so really well is to nourish the creative thinking skills, the creative capacities, the social skills of young children. All children are born like scientists. This is the amazing thing. You know? They don't believe you anything. They try out everything. They experiment. They have those kinds of kind of skills. And I think the Haus der Klein Forscher is amazing in how we can nourish those kinds of capabilities. They don't come natural by themselves. It requires, I think, deliberate effort. And then, of course, you know, when children get to school, we try to take as much as we can away from that. No? We make them believe into things. We make them listen to authorities rather than to their kind of own inquiry. And uh, we teach them religion, all those kinds of things. But this is later. I think in the early years, we have a real opportunity to nourish the kind of 21st century skills that are going to make people successful in tomorrow's world. And that's already, I'm already in the middle of my presentation. I want to talk a bit about later life, the age of 15. In the year 2006, we assessed the scientific thinking skills of people in our PISA assessment at age 15. We did not look at, you know, how much did you learn in biology and chemistry and physics. We wanted to test, actually, to what extent can students think like a scientist. And now you think, well, you know, the year 2006 is really a long, long time away. No? And it is, in fact, you know. It was the year before the iPhone was invented. No? We didn't have smartphones, all the kind of things we take for granted today. No? Twitter was still a sound, you know. The Amazon was still a river. No? An app was what you'd send to college. No? But actually, learning outcomes between 2006 and 2009 have actually not changed. No? We've had not, you know, the world is changing. What we do in science hasn't really developed very much, and the world didn't stop in 2009, you know. Maps became dynamic, we use them every day. Cars became electric, now they drive us out a driver. No? Huge changes in our environments. And again, we saw very little development in that years. No? And just think about, you know, the last three years, you know, robotics, you know, cloud computing, biogenetics, huge transformations in our lives. And they are no longer, and this is important, they are no longer the per, uh, sort of the subject of a few specialists. You know, some people become engineers. They are in everybody's life. That's the, the, and again, you know, you could see in education, not much of a change. No. The gap between what our societies demand from people and what's happening in our schools is becoming wider every day in the STEM fields. No. Now, there are some countries that have seen more progress. You can see, you know, a country in Portugal, nobody looked at that for a long time, but they actually, you know, step by step, build a 21st century curriculum. And actually, if you try to look at innovative curriculum design today, you know, Portugal is a great example. You can learn a lot from this. And then, you, of course, you have Singapore moves from good to great every day. Now, this is also an important lesson. Countries who do well, don't stop so that everybody else can catch up. They actually keep moving forward as well. No? And then you can see sort of Germany, sort of an average performer, does quite well in scientific thinking skills, but, you know, no improvement either. No? Huge changes in the world, very little in the field of education. Now, some people say, well, schools can't really do very much about it. No? And I just want to show you one slide on this to give you a bit more hope, you know. And this is basically looking at science, skills by decile of social background. No? The red square are the 10% most disadvantaged students in the Dominican Republic. No? You can see their scores are really poor. The green triangle are the wealthiest children, and you can see they do a lot better. And this is often used as an argument to say that you know, poverty is destiny. This is not about school, this is about social society and all this kind of context. No? But if that were true, you'd see the same picture in every country, and you do not. In fact, you know, when you compare the red dots across countries, these are children from similar social backgrounds. But they perform hugely different across countries. No? The most amazing ones are these. You know, look at Vietnam or you know, Estonia. 
you can think that the 10% most disadvantaged children, when it comes to their scientific thinking skills, do as well as the average child in the industrialized world. And they do better than the 10% wealthiest children in the whole of Latin America. Poverty is not destiny. There is a lot that learning, that education can do to develop the kind of scientific thinking skills that we need to talk about. So that's really very, very important. Now, there's another side to this. You know, when we talk about science, you think about cognitive skills, no? thinking like a scientist, you know, solving scientific problems. But there's also an important social and emotional aspect to this. Now, do you really want to become a scientist? Do you believe in scientific inquiry as a method to solve social problems? You know, we looked at that. We asked students, you know, you want to become a scientist? Is that something you want to do in your life? And you can see, I just told you, you know, a country like Germany does quite well when it comes to science skills in school. But when you ask them, you know, is that something that has meaning for you, yourself, in your own life? Not really, it's for other people, no. And you think about other countries, also the Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, even the Finnish, same category. They do really well on the PISA test, but this doesn't mean anything for their lives. This is just a school subject that they have learned because somebody asked them to do that. You look at the United States, they do not very well on the PISA test, but everybody wants to become scientists. No. And you look at this chart and you ask yourself, well, then maybe we have to make a choice. You know, either we educate children well and then they're going to be great, or you know, they trust in science. No. But actually, it's not so simple. And you can also see there are huge gender gaps in the aspirations of people. No. In fact, that is so interesting. On the PISA test, we don't see gender difference between, you know, there's no performance difference among boys and girls. This is a big success of education over the last 20 years. Girls are now doing as well as boys in science. We should be proud of this. But when you ask boys and girls, you know, do you see science as something that is going to open life opportunities for you? Huge gender gaps. No? So we should not be surprised when you look at who's going to enter a university in science courses or engineering or mathematics or computing. No? All the boys. It has nothing to do with their cognitive abilities, nothing to do with their content knowledge. It has to do with the kind of aspirations that people develop. No? And the interesting thing is, you know, you ask yourself, do you have to make those trade-offs? Let's put the students in red that are doing well in science, in purple, the one who believe in scientific inquiry as a method to solve social problems. No? That is very, very important as well. You encounter something, you know, climate change and so on. Do you think this is something to do with science? Can we actually address this with scientific methods? Or is it something, you know, that politicians are going to solve for us? No? And then, in blue, the people who want to become scientists. No? And the question, of course, is can you get in the center of that? No? Can you do everything? And there are actually countries that show us these are not either or. If you're in Singapore, in Canada, or Australia, those countries are really, really good in getting students to develop high levels of cognitive skills and as well the kind of social and emotional attributes that actually help them develop this. No? Then you have countries that are doing parts of this. I showed you already a long list of countries that are only doing well on the cognitive part. You know, Schooling has done what we were told to do, but nothing more. No. United States, Spain, I already showed you, you know, students believe in science, they want to become scientists, but they're not prepared for that. No. That's also not good enough. No. But the message really is you can get really well into the center. Those kinds of trade-offs that we make are not really necessarily ones. And we have part of the answer, you know, what, why they get into the center. Look at this. On the horizontal axis, you see the performance of students in science. On the vertical axis, whether they want to become scientists. And now the line shows you something about motivation. If students are not enjoying science, no, if this is a boring school subject, there's almost no relationship between doing better in school and wanting to become a scientist. No? If students do enjoy science, you can suddenly see you know, how strong that relationship becomes. And I tell you, this is something that you do in the very first years of a life of a child. Do they really enjoy this? Does it relate to them? Does it have meaning to them as opposed to you know, just being taught by some teacher? No? Enjoyment of science is the best predictor that we have to translate cognitive abilities into doing something with this in your own life. No? And actually, if you look at neuroscience these days, you know, those windows are actually quite narrow. 
we talk, you know, the year two, year five, you know, those are the kind of ages where we can really do something about that social attachment to school subjects. No? Cognitive development, you know, we can do pretty much throughout our lives, but it's those kind of, these kind of paradigms that we really need to move very, very early on by getting people, not, you know, more science knowledge into kindergarten, but by giving them the methods to do inquiry and research and everything. Why does this matter for tomorrow's world? You know, that's, I think, something really important. Have a look at this, you know, digitalization, what it is doing to us every day. Connecting, you know, people, cities, countries, continents. Now, that's why we're sitting today together from 28 countries here. No. This is the world in which we live. No. What we do affects everyone. It's been hugely democratizing. Everybody can participate. Everybody can collaborate. No. We can all have a voice. But it's also hugely concentrating powers. No. Think about Google. Think about Amazon. In fact, Google makes a million dollars per employee. That's about 10 times what the average American company does. No. That is what scale without mass is about. Leaving people out of the equation. Huge concentration of powers. And that ha I, I'm going to come to what this has to stem. Second part, you know, digitalization is hugely particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everyone. You know, do something on Twitter and everybody can listen to you if they want. But it's also hugely homogenizing. Squashing individuality, squashing cultural uniqueness. It's going to be harder and harder for us, you know, to embrace diversity. Digitalization makes you talk to people who are like you, you know, who are, believe in similar things like you. Creating the kind of echo chambers that actually compartmentalize society. You're much less likely these days to meet someone who is different from you in the digital world than you were 20 years ago. You know. Again, what is kindergarten schooling going to do about it? It's the first place where you encounter the diversity of society. It doesn't come from home, doesn't come from your neighborhood. The diversity of society, that's where you meet people who think differently from you, who are differently from you. And that's what STEM education is about, you know, helping you to enable divergent thinking, helping you to think you know, like a scientist, think like a philosopher, all at the same time. Digitalization is hugely empowering. You know, Berlin is a great example for this. You have entrepreneurs who have nothing except an idea. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you want to do something new, you have to build a huge factory. You have to have a lot of money. You have to hire a lot of people, buy a lot of machines. Today, you need none of this. You need one big idea. All the big innovations, you look at Google, Facebook, they all started with an idea. They had the idea before they had the product, before they had the money. That's the time in which we live. But the other part of this, you can see that in Berlin as well, you know, you have the Uber taxi driver who comes because he's a slave of technology. That's something is disempowering at the very same time. And I'm going to argue in the remaining time that I have that where you stand on this equation has a lot to do with the skills you have and stem very much at the heart of this. It starts, you know, if you think about the knowledge which is around us, it's no longer in the kind of silos. You can no longer teach, and we know that, you can no longer teach someone for their life, filling them up with you know, specific content and then expecting them to live on that knowledge. Their learning is the work. We used to learn to work, now learning is the work. Learning is interconnected. Knowledge networks change every day. This is also why it's so important to think across the boundaries of disciplinary context. STEM is again at the heart of this. You think about STEM in the past, we talk about you know, biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. That's the STEM of the past. The STEM of today is really about thinking like a scientist, thinking across the boundaries thinking in multiple dimensions and multiple perspectives all at the same time. It's really about systems thinking. And I highlight this because one of the things that we tend to do in education, we take a big problem, chop it up into smaller and smaller pieces, and then train students to do the little pieces. No. But the way you actually create value these days is by creating the bigger picture, connecting the dots where the next innovation is going to come from. No. Design thinking. A lot of people think, you know, Innovation is all about creativity. Well, creativity is a very important part of innovation. But innovation is about a lot more. Innovation is actually a very systematic process of experimentation, of you know, design thinking behind it. Information literacy. You know. Literacy in the past was easy. You take a book, you read it, and you absorb the information. If your educator thinks you don't know the answer to something, they can tell you, look it up in an encyclopedia, and you can trust the answer to be true. 
Today, you look up something on Google and you get 29,000 answers to your question and nobody tells you what is true, what's right, what's wrong. You have to construct information. The literacy of the 21st century is not about extracting information, it's about constructing information. Figuring out what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's not true. And that has a lot more to do with scientific ways of thinking than you might think. Digital literacy, obviously global competency, seeing the world through different lenses and perspectives, appreciating different ways of thinking, different cultures, very important today as well. And we can see how difficult that it really is. You look at the refugee crisis in Europe, you know, 400 million people live on this continent. We take, you know, a couple of million of people in and we have a huge kind of social problem uh, because, you know, we cannot absorb diversity in the way. You can see the same in classrooms. You know. The greatest difficulties teachers face this day is to deal with diversity. I'm not saying this because I believe that. We actually collect the data on this. Now, we ask teachers, you know, what are your greatest challenges? Number one challenge, not just in Germany because, you know, taking a lot of refugees and so on. In every country of the OECD, Diversity, the big challenge, right? global competency at the heart. This is really what we're talking about. Now, robots taking over whole factories. And here's a nice chart that looks actually at the labor demand. When you think about job losses, you know, that's what we all are you know, talking about. We always talk about the risks of digitalization rather than the opportunities. Now, none of your children would want to live 10 years ago, you know, or 20 years ago. Now, but we still see that kind of risk. But what's interesting, when you look at labor demand, Actually, the steepest decline in the demand for skills is no longer manual skills, no? things you do with your hands. That's what we associate with digitalization, you don't know, robots producing all these things. No, it's actually routine cognitive skills. The kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, have also become easy to digitize, to automate, to outsource. The big increases in the demand for skills is what we call non-routine analytic skills. No? This is about using your knowledge creatively, extrapolating from what you know, applying your knowledge in novel situations. And it's social skills now. The green line is really interesting. You no longer solve problems on your own, you solve problems together with others. No? Something in a couple of weeks, we're going to launch the first PISA assessment on collaborative problem-solving skills. And you're going to see really big surprises in this. Now, some children who are great individual problem-solvers, they have so great difficulties, you know, even imagining that they need to share and jointly develop their knowledge. No. Where do you learn this? Where do you develop social skills? Actually, the early years. That's from, from brain science, shows us very clearly social skills. That's where the window is. But also, that's, we, are, we are much more open in, in terms of innovative learning environments. Now, in school, we sit students behind individual desks. Now, we ask them to do an individual test, an exam, and so on all the kind of parameters around individual learning. In the early years, play is natural. Children also have no difficulties to play with children who look completely different from them, who, think of, who speak a completely different language. These things matter for us, they don't matter for children. That is basically, and you can see actually, later on in life, this is the biggest differentiator you have. So, the canned knowledge, that we put a great premium on, actually losing most rapidly in value. I think it's a very, very important point. Everybody these days talks about losses in productivity. But the story, and it's true, on average, you know, we are spending more and we produce less. That's true for the industrialized world. But actually, the picture is much more nuanced. When you look at the frontier firms, you can see actually productivity keeps rising. The, the, the companies at the frontier, who are the knowledge frontier, keep growing. They keep doing more with less. You, I ex give you the example of Google. It's the kind of laggards that are seeing the losses in productivity. The problem that we have today is one of knowledge diffusion. What story am I telling you here? In the past, it was enough to educate a few people really well, to run our factories and companies and everything, and a lot of people who follow them. And that's what you get from that. Today, we need everybody to become a scientist, to think like a scientist, to be at the knowledge frontier. Knowledge diffusion is the biggest differentiator in our economies. If we want to actually see economic development and growth for everyone, we've got to take everybody forward. And now you say, well, that's just, you know, car factories and manufacturing. You see the same pattern in the service industry. 
Same kind of development of productivity today is about knowledge diffusion, it's about absorbing new practices and so on. If we don't succeed with this, we're going to be all in trouble. No? Robotics, obvious example, augmented reality. No? Germany is a country where a lot of people you know, put a lot a premium on vocational education training, no? telling people something, you know, giving them you know, a lot of knowledge how to solve practical problems. Well, you know, maybe in the future you have a screen or an audio device and so on telling you all the kind of steps. The machines are going to be better in this. And I think what this tells us is that the world will no longer reward people just for what they know. No? Google knows everything. The world will reward people for what they can do with what they know. No? And again, children are much better in this than adults. No? And there's going to be a lot more. I'm not going to talk about this. Huge developments. Some people have talked about this as a race between technology and education, you know. Before the Industrial Revolution, neither education nor technology mattered a lot for the vast majority of people. No? But, you know, the Industrial Revolution changed all of this. It moved technology ahead of people and, you know, it caused huge social pain. You know, today we're all proud of those achievements. You wouldn't have wanted to live in those times because in all likelihood, you would be among those who would be left behind. No. Huge social pain. But, you know, we invented schooling at that time. That was the response of public policy. We moved people ahead of technology and that's what created generations of prosperity. No. But today, yeah, I mentioned this already, we see exactly the same pattern. Digitalization is once more, you know, moving technology ahead of people, and we are seeing the same pattern of social pain, people left behind who actually pay a huge price for this. No? If we're honest, you know, globalization is good on average for everybody, integration, digitalization, but actually there are some people who pay the price for this, and actually they become more and more vocal. No? So the question is really, you know, how can we move education again ahead of the technologies that frame our societies, and that's really where STEM education needs to come in. Of course, you know, I'm only talking about one aspect, digitalization. If you think about the increasing volatility, complexity, ambiguity of our world, there are many other dimensions as well. You have this kind of rapidly expanding knowledge of our times, which has so many different facets, and all of those facets are associated with people. That's very, very important. Knowledge never exists in abstract. It's always communicated with people. No? We learn. Learning is a very social process. No? And then we have the very small world of schooling, which is really small. You have only a sort of certain number of hours in a day. And of course, we try to squeeze all of this into this little box. No? But what happens, and I think STEM is the best example, the moment we do that in our current systems, what we do in school becomes just a very shallow shadow of the true kind of richness of the world. You know? STEM is about experimentation, trying out things, you know, seeing cause and effect, you know, designing an experiment, all of this. No? STEM in school is about formulas, equations, very complicated things. No? We have succeeded to make this a misery, and actually you can test it. When you ask at four, uh, fourth graders in school, that's the earliest for which we have comparable data, even at fourth grades, most children are absolutely enthusiastic about science. It's one of their favorite subjects. You do that at age 15, most people see no meaning in it. They do not see it. You saw the data. No? But our response is, you know, just put more and more and more and more and more things into this box. And that's where we end up with. No? And what we really lose is the kind of big paradigms that are going to differentiate us from technology. No? The question of our times is how can we pair the artificial intelligence that exists with the kind of human qualities that are going to enable that kind of technological potential? No? If we succeed to make students only almost as smart as a smartphone, you know, we are running behind technology. We are thinking about, you know, substitution, not complementarity. You know? And I think those are the kind of questions that we really have in front of us. We think about this at the OECD very hard. You know, we have just developed a, f a framework, and I have my colleague Lars Bartet here, who is actually the expert on that thinking about what are those kinds of qualities that are going to make people successful. The knowledge, you know, Content knowledge, obviously, equally important, the epistemic understanding. No. Can you think like an historian, think like a philosopher, and so on? The skills, what can you do? Enabling, enacting, but also attitudes and values. No. Do you believe you can change things? No. Self-efficacy, resilience. No. Are you going to try again when you didn't succeed? No. That's the kind of world in which we live. It's very unpredictable. 
Those kinds of attitudes and values, the social values. Yeah? Do we believe in the common good? Do we see competences as something that's creating social value? Those things come together. And we see basically three things at the heart of this. Now, the first has to do with creating you know, innovation. It's about you know, creating new value, creating something that is of intrinsic positive worth. And all children want to do that. You know, that's, if we give them the tools and the opportunities, children create amazing things. It's very, very hard to do that later in your life. The second part is you know, <clears throat> the capacity to reconcile tensions and dilemmas. It's no longer about either or. There are trade-offs to be made. There are tensions which, which children need to deal with. No? Climate change, you know, there's a collective good, there's an individual good, there's tomorrow and there's today. We have to find the right balance between different priorities and tensions and dilemmas with no easy answers. And that's something that we think is also very much at the heart. And you can see already the connections with STEM. And the last part is really about people taking action, people taking responsibility, no? seeing themselves as an actor in this, seeing themselves as people who can actually change things. You know, there was something very interesting. We tested in our PISA tests environmental literacy. No? And then we also asked about you know, environmental optimism. Sort of, do people believe that the big kind of social challenges of our time are going to be changed? And what you could see is actually an amazing negative correlation. The less people knew about science, the less they were able to think like a scientist, the more optimistic they were that politicians are going to solve all of this tomorrow. <laughs> and I think that tells you something, you know. The belief in ideologies, ideas, you know, politics rises when our ability to sort of embrace the kind of complexity of the world really lowers. And I see very, very important, you know, people taking responsibility. People who are, do not understand, you know, how the world functions are unlikely to engage and take ownership in creating change, being actors for change. So those three classes of competences are really at the heart. Thinking about science, you know, what we want students is to be able to explain what they see. We want them to evaluate and design scientific inquiry. And we want them to be able to do deal with an increasingly data-rich world. No? Data is everything these days. That's what competency is really. And this, of course, has to do with knowledge, with content knowledge, with knowledge of procedures, methods, epistemic understanding, and so on. It also has to do with attitudes, the attitudes toward science, no? the attitudes, uh, also the scientific attitudes are very, very important. We need to nourish them. Actually, early in life is your best bet to make a big difference. There's really, I mean, so much evidence about this. Once children are in school, those kind of relationships are very, very, very hard to change. The dispositions, to what extent you know, you believe in those kinds of things, are very much framed. I want to just show you one piece of data. This is also, again, about 15-year-olds. I don't have any earlier data. Chinese Taipei, no? a country that does really well on PISA. Students do extremely well on content knowledge, but they are not so great when it comes to epistemic understanding and you know, thinking like a scientist. And now you're going to tell me why we knew that. You know, it's all these Asian countries that drill students with content knowledge so they can't think very well. No? But actually, when you look at other Asian countries, you look at Singapore, Singapore is doing even better on content knowledge than Chinese to pay, but actually the Singaporean students can, are stronger than anybody else in the world in having those kinds of inquiry-based scientific skills. They can design their own experiments. No? Here this thing gets surprising. No? I, I'm showing you this because I think we need to get away from the stereotypes, you know. We know all of this, other people are not as great at this, you know. You look at Germany, you know? here is the content knowledge, not so great, and now I know what you think, you know. Wow, we don't care so much about content, we think about, you know, uh, scientific inquiry, but actually it's even less. You know? I think we need to take those things to heart, you know. This is something, start early on. You know? Sometimes we believe we do the right things and often they're not happening. We actually surveyed teachers on this. You know, the vast majority of teachers in OECD countries say, you know, my role as a teacher is to facilitate students' own inquiry. Students learn best when they learn on their own, and I'm the moderator, the facilitator, the evaluator, the coach, you know all of those things. No? When we actually look what happens in the classroom, exactly the reverse in those countries. No? The teacher believes, but actually the reality in the classroom 
is still very much road climbing. No? I'm going to show you this just on a few things, why this actually matters. You know, the oldest learning strategy in life is memorization. Yeah? Now you just absorb something. But when you actually map that against, you know, the task complexity, you can see memorization can help you with some very easy tasks. But actually, as the world gets more complicated, memorization doesn't help you. No? That's a very, very important message because you ask yourself, you know, a country like Germany, how much emphasis we put to teach students something. But when you give them complex problems, you can really see it's not a good way to actually help people succeed. No? That's why, you know, hard work, there's almost no relationship between the number of hours we teach in a country and the quality of the scientific thinking skills of students. There's actually a negative relationship overall. The longer children spend in school, the less creative they are often in many countries. No? Very, very important to, to look at this. And this is pre precisely because some of the skills are not conducive to better outcomes. Control strategies. No? Uh, you mentioned this already, Michael, when you, have te when you teach people how to learn, to manage their learning, to set their goals, to persevere, all of those things. That's a really good predictor for actually doing better on almost all types of problems. But you also see it works somehow less when the things get really, really difficult no? on the right side. So actually to do well on the right side needs something else. And this is about you know, creative thinking skills, connecting what you know with something that, you are unex that you're not expecting, being open to novelty, intellectual curiosity. And these things can be taught, they can be learned. And you can see they are the predictor or what makes you successful in tomorrow's world. And I'm, you know, we have data for every country. You can really see how much countries are struggling with this in the world. And I would really think in the early years, we have the best chances of doing this. We have the greatest openness in our education system to those kinds of thinking skills. And we have the best facilities among people in their lifespan to actually nourish this. So the big world of learning is about rigor, what I mean by this is cognitive demand. No? It's about, you know, expecting everybody, expecting, and this is a sort of easy to say, very hard to do, expecting that every child can learn. Most systems that do really well, for teachers it's natural. You know, if a student doesn't learn, I need to find a different way of teaching, learning, no? engaging with diversity, but expecting that everybody can succeed. And you can see, you could saw the first slide, this happens. Focus is the hardest thing in education, teaching you a few things really well. You know, our instructional systems have become a mile wide and an inch deep. We put more and more stuff on top of the system and uh, we lose the kind of depth and the thinking skills that are precisely the differentiator for tomorrow. And we're all guilty of this because we all have ideas what should happen in school. Now, today we think it's, you know, digital literacy. No? We want to teach three-year-olds coding. No? And by the age they graduate, they will ask, you know, what was coding, by the way? Explain that to me again. You know? Things change. Tomorrow we're going to say it's about environmental literacy. No? And then comes something else. Every day we put something else on top of the system rather than thinking about what are the kind of fundamentals, the building blocks to help you to understand the foundations of learning. And coherence is about meaningful learning progressions. We're just beginning to start to understand how the brain actually learns, what we do best at what age of a person's development and building this into learning progressions. Remaining true to the disciplines, but strengthening interdisciplinary learning, easy to say, really, really hard to do. Balancing knowledge of the disciplines with knowledge about the disciplines. And it's the about that is gaining prominence. You just saw that. Focusing on areas with a high transfer value that where students can extrapolate from, what's going to keep currency. You know. Having learning environments that are thematic, that are problem-based, that are project-based, where we co-create knowledge between learners, educators. You know. Again, something that early learning does really amazingly well. You know. Co-creation is something that really happens there. In school, we're losing a lot of this, but that's basically about relevance. You know. And you see more and more students dropping out from science. It's not because they're stupid. It's because simply that has become so boring, so kind of irrelevant to their lives that we lose them. Or they drop out of school altogether. And that's basically something we really need to change. And also, you know, the hardest part for me is always, and this is also on the measurement side, the hardest part, we need to realize that some things are caught, not taught. Particularly when you think about character qualities, you know, curiosity, courage, leadership, you know, 
you observe them. They're about behavior. It's very hard to teach them in a direct way, but I think this is about tomorrow. So let me wrap this up in a few words. In the past, it was enough to educate some people really well, because you know our societies were structured in this way. Today, we really need everybody to succeed at very, very high levels. Now, the demands of our societies are going to be huge. Now. We can no longer deal with this in redistribution. You know, just taking money from the rich, giving it to, to the poor, and so on. Dealing with the consequences of inequality. We need to deal with the sources of inequality, and they are reliant in the skills of people. No? You know, sometimes when you read articles these days, okay, you know, it's very easy to solve. Let's just give everybody a certain income, and then everybody will be happy, and then some people are going to be the great innovators. You know, what kind of humanity does that imply, where only some people are you know, productive members of society and everybody is a con consumer? No? So this is a big challenge for all of us. We need to move from the kind of delivery of wisdom, the kind of front-loaded education, towards actually creating knowledge at the frontier, in the classroom, among students, among teachers. The kind of co-creation of learning, innovative learning environments, I think is going to be really a big differentiator. You know? Learning systems where we no longer just you know, look up to the next level in the system, which is all about you know, vertical information flows and accountability, to learning systems that are much more devolved and outward looking, where you know, people know what other people are doing. Schools know what other schools are doing, and education systems are knowing what other education systems are knowing. You know, this morning I was asked a question, you know, why do you need to do this in an international conference? No? Why do we need to bring 28 countries together? Isn't that a very kind of local business? There's no other sector in our societies which would ask that question. And we'd be always curious to learn from each other, to ask, learn with each other, and so on. It's natural to us. If you are a medical doctor, you do a clinical trial, you find out something really great, you're going to tell everybody, you become super rich. Everybody in the world is going to use your knowledge. In education, you know, we keep it as our best kept secret, and we don't have kind of systems in there. And actually, you know, we ask teachers about that. The biggest first frustration of teachers in, in the OECD countries was that, you know, nobody cares. That's the perception that remains. You know, if I do something more innovative, will I be recognized for it, rewarded for this? 23% of teachers believe that you know, being more creative, more innovative, is going to be good. The vast majority believes that the environment in which they work every day is hostile to innovation. How are we going to create tomorrow's innovators in that kind of context? No. And this is the chart I already mentioned. You know, if I give you one more hour of science learning, you get better science outcomes within every country. That works in every country that we have data for. No. Learning time is a good predictor of individual success. You do that across countries, and the relationship turns negative. No? The longer children spend in school, the worse they come out in PISA. No? <laughs> in science. So what's the answer to this? Now, isn't that a contradiction? Learning time is a great thing within a country, and learning time seems to be somehow detracting from success across country. Well, actually, the answer is very, very simple. The answer is that the quality of learning is always the product of the quantity, the time that you spend, and the learning environment. How much learn in an hour? And you can see that actually very nicely. This is the learning time of children in school, in uh, all subjects together, in blue in school, and yellow is what happens out of a school. No? And you can really see how this differs. No? You look at the United Arab Emirates or China, 60 hours is what children spend learning per week. No, no adult would be allowed to work that much. No? Uh, in Finland, you have about a little more than half of that, no? relatively short school days. No? But when you actually look at the kind of productivity, you know, learning, learning gains per hour of instruction, you can see in Finland, they learn a lot in very little time. In the United Arab Emirates, they have a lot of time, but they learn very little. No? And I think it's a very important message for us to think more creatively about the quality. In the past, you know, education was all compartmentalized. Science and STEM was about biology, math, you know, uh, uh, chemistry, and so on. The future needs to be much more about you know, cross-disciplinary thinking, integrated learning environments, project-based learning environments. Some countries do that really well. Japan you know, has an integrated course of study where actually the STEM teacher needs to work together, sometimes with a history teacher, sometimes with a sports teacher, to think about you know, how do we actually work together across the boundaries to help our students to look at problems through multiple lenses. 
which STEM is not. The future is going to be integrated with real-world contexts, with real-world kind of situations across disciplines. The past, every student was taught in the very same way. We see very clearly that this no longer works. We wouldn't give everybody the same medicine, you know? We think about, you know, what can we do for you? How can we actually develop you, uh, cure you? In education, we still have this idea. Everybody learns in the same way. We teach people in the same way. And that's very damaging. That is another factor that contributes by how many, so many people leave school, drop out of this. No? If you'd run a supermarket rather than a school, you know, and you'd find, you know, from 100 customers, 30 walk out every day without buying anything. And you see this on Monday, on Tuesday, next week, next year, and so on. You change your inventory. You, know, you start to think, you know, what are my customers really looking for? We do not ask that question in education. We have a very supply-sided kind of view and the idea of how we embrace diversity with more differentiated practice. Now, this is not about leveling down the horizon of students in you know, a kind of tracking or streaming in education. That's actually really damaging. It is about you know, embracing different ways of learning with much more differentiated pedagogy. It's about moving from standardization, conformity, and compliance to actually fostering ingenuity. It's about, you know, from looking at learning as a place to seeing learning as an activity. And again, you know, I think this is where early learning is so much ahead of schooling. You know, children play in many different situations, many different contexts. STEM learning, and again, how's the uh, client foster? It's, in, it's an amazing example, you know. You change the context. You make STEM part of the kind of environment, you know, building this into an activity, how much more we could achieve and have this happened in school. And then, you know, technically it's about moving from administrative control and accountability to the kind of professional forms of work organization where we do create an environment that gives people much more space to work with each other, learn from each other. And this is something where we can, again, learn from Finland and Europe or from many of the Asian countries. You know. Teachers would teach a lot less than teachers in Germany or Europe. You know. Sometimes a STEM teacher teaches only between 11 and 16 hours per week, but they work a lot with each other to frame good practice, to do their own research. You know. The teacher remains a learner themselves rather than just a teacher of something. You know. Very, very important on this. Public versus private, now we still have a lot of kind of ideas, you know, there are two worlds that should be separate and, you know, they should not be confounded. In fact, you know, I think there's a lot we can learn to build the kind of innovative partnerships that capitalize on this. And last but not least, you know, moving from very idiosyncratic kind of things that we do to education every day, you know, putting a new idea on top, you know, towards a much better alignment in the way we design, implement and achieve public policies. A lot we can really do, but you can see in all of this how, how much STEM learning has become you know, mainstream, no longer being the subject of a few people who need to have specific skills for their life, but really it's an attitude. You know, STEM has become almost you know, a way of looking at life, and looking at problems, of being capable to embrace an increasingly volatile, complex and ambiguous world. Thank you very much. <coughs>